I think of the word cleanup to me, it sounds like someone spilled milk in the kitchen and we need to go deal with that, right? But I think when you think in the context of sustainability, it's not just about past, it's also about ongoing contamination. And so I really want to get that, that thought in your head now. For folks who are not familiar with the Duwamish River, this is a historic <laughs> depiction of um, what it looked like pre-industrialization. And I picked out very useful landmarks for folks um, that will hopefully resonate with you. But you can see, historically, it was a meandering system. It came up from the upper watershed and the green Duwamish watershed. It came down, came through. It's, estuary, it's an estuarine system, so it's tidally influenced, meaning that that water from Elliott Bay comes in, and then at certain times of the day, it's the actual the river that's pushing out. There's a, so there's salt water and freshwater influence. And um, when we talk about the communities that are most impacted, we really focus primarily a lot on Georgetown and South Park. And so um, the boots, uh, if anyone knows Georgetown, there's a, a great park that has cowboy boots. And then on the other side, the west side of the river, we have South Park. So here's what the Duwamish looks like today. The system's completely altered. So turning around the uh, last century, it was channelized, and industry came to its shores. It became a huge economic powerhouse for Seattle that was developing at the time. And with that came contamination. So here's what we have today, a highly altered system. And we know that contamination happened. Where do we start? Well, first off, our mission is to protect human health and the environment. So what does that mean in the context of the Duwamish? Well, we know that there are people who are actively fishing the river, consuming fish out of the river. We know that there are a lot of public access points. So there's public um, people maybe playing in the mud, digging. We also know that there's wildlife. If you go down to the Duwamish on any given day, I am always amazed. I see osprey, I see herons, I see river otters. It's amazing what you can see in just a few like hours on the Duwamish. So obviously, human health and the environment check. We have, we have those as aspects going on. And then on top of it, people live down here and they work down there. So there's a lot of people coming in every day to work there and make their livelihood. When we think about um, cleanups, the next thing we need to think about is where is the contamination? So you have the lower five miles of the Duwamish River is what we call the Lower Duwamish Waterway. And there's contamination, there's 41 chemicals that we think about that are concerning to the Environmental Protection Agency, and four of them are our main risk drivers. So there's PCBs, arsenic, carcinogenic polyaromatic hydrocarbons, I love the names of our stuff, it's such a mouthful, and um, dioxins and furans. So these chemicals are in the air, they're in the water, they're in the fish tissue. But what we really have figured out through our own risk assessment process is that a lot of this contamination comes to lie in the sediments. And when it comes into the sediments, you have clams, you have worms, um, a lot of benthic invertebrates, they're uptaking that contamination. Then those are eaten by prey species, which are eaten by other prey species, and before you know it, it's getting into your ospreys, your humans, and that's how it's getting into the, um, throughout the entire ecosystem. So what do we do with that information? Well, then we think about what does that mean in terms of risk? And for us, risk means things, mortality, obviously that's an unacceptable endpoint, cancer, disease, and when we look at it in that context, we realize that there is an unacceptable amount of risk for the upper, um, I'm trying not to use too much technical terminology, for the upper level organisms like the ospreys and the river otters, for humans consuming fish, for people who may be accessing the actual sediments themselves, and the clams and the other um, benthic invertebrates that live in the actual sediments. I want you to take a second and, and stop for here. So we've got a lot of information. We know what the contaminants are. We know what our endpoints are. So how is it when you have a big decision, you make that choice? Some of you, I'm gonna go with something that may resonate. You may be thinking about colleges. Well, what do you think about when you think about which college you might wanna go to? Maybe you're thinking about proximity to your house. Maybe you're thinking about where your friends are going. Maybe it's a program you're interested in. Well, just like a big decision, like where you're gonna go to college, you create your own criteria. We have criteria that we have to consider when we're developing our plan. So these are some of the criteria we would think about. First and foremost, are we going to protect human health and the environment? The next thing we wanna think about is our laws. Are we complying with our environmental laws? There are a lot of laws that we need to consider. Clean Air Act, Clean Water Act. So that's part of our decision making. The technologies, what technologies are available? Are they effective? Are they accessible? Are they, are they reasonable? Community acceptance. We have a very active community in the Duwamish. 
they understandably have got a vested interest in the long-term outcome of this project, so they need to be included. And finally, cost. You can have the most amazing technology and plans possible, but if you can't afford it, then it's not practicable. EPA took those criteria and we looked at various technologies. And the first one we looked at is removal. And this is a pretty easy concept. You characterize the contamination in the sediment, you bring in equipment, you dredge out that contamination, and then you put in clean backfill. This is as opposed to removing the contamination, you're actually isolating it so it can't be released into the environment. So you're gonna put in an isolation layer and then some clean material on top so the invertebrates can survive and live and thrive. Um, but you're not actually gonna be removing it from the site. And then we have more passive techniques. So we know that the incoming sediment quality is better than the existing sediment quality. Remember, we're a watershed here. So you have all of this sediment that's coming in from the entire green Duwamish. And so over time, it will deposit in some areas. And um, that can be a passive way of getting cleanup to occur. Enhanced natural recovery, what we mean there is that we add about six to nine inches of clean sediment to kind of help kickstart the process. So EPA evaluated all of these various options and what we ended up picking was a combination. Um, in the most contaminated areas, we're actively removing and remediating, so we're, we're using our removal activities and our containment activities, and then we're using our passive um, processes where it's less contaminated. We think it's gonna take about 17 years and it's gonna cost around $342 million. So that is our plan, it came out last January 2014. December, sorry, 2014. So now you have a cleanup plan in place, but before we can begin anything, we really need to look at the ongoing sources of contamination. And you guys have, I think, been a little familiar with some of these concepts. So for example, let's take an idea of this site. Let's say we were gonna to try to put capping right here underneath this pipe. Well, first off, you probably want to think about what's going on with that outfall. Is there contamination coming through it? What's the contamination? Can you control it? Is it going to recontaminate your clean backfill that you just placed in there? Similarly, you have to think about what's going on that you can't see. For example, groundwater contamination. Is there a plume that's moving towards the waterway? Can it get breakthrough? Is that going to cause contamination? So before you do anything, you need to really understand ongoing sources to your site. Cleanups are not necessarily the cleanest operations. So the other thing you need to do is to minimize the risk that you're actually gonna cause more contamination. So let's use this example. We're gonna take a removal site here. You can see there's a house there, there's a pier. Well, just even something as simple as getting rid of that pier. Those pilings are covered in creosote. If you're not careful in how you take those pilings out, they're going to get crushed and they're going to release that creosote, which has got contaminants in it, into the waterway. Similarly, with every single dredge bucket that you put into the river, you're resuspending contaminated sediments into the waterway. Remember, it's estuarine, so it's moving back and forth throughout the day. It's gonna be moving all over the site. You don't wanna cause a bigger mess than you started with, so you need to manage that. Also, depending on the technology you do use, every bucket you pull up has got so much water. So you're picking up these huge buckets of contaminated sediments and you're putting them on barges, and there is a ton of water to manage and that water is contaminated, and you don't just want it to get right back into the system. So you're gonna to have to figure out how do you manage all of these potential variables to not only clean up the river, but prevent recontaminating it. And finally, don't forget people are living here and we're using heavy equipment. It's loud, there's diesel emissions. You don't wanna inconvenience a lot of people or risk their health, so you're gonna to have to also mitigate for that. And finally, once you've completed the cleanup activity, you have to monitor, right? So we're gonna do long-term monitoring of the sediment, of the water column, and the tissue to see if we're meeting our overall cleanup objectives. But this is really the take-home point for me, which is the Superfund cleanup is a part of the overall process of cleaning up the Duwamish, and that's that lower five miles there. But the fate of the Duwamish is bigger than one program, it's bigger than one agency, it's bigger than one effort. Because it really depends on what's going on in your watershed. So on a watershed level, you have contaminants that are cycling all the time. Things are evaporating, they're coming in through the rain, they're coming in through your stormwater systems, there's erosion of contaminated sediments that's moving downstream. So using this example, our cleanup level for PCBs is two parts per billion for PCBs. But based on modeling, we think that the contamination that's coming down in the sediments is probably closer to 50 parts per billion. 
we're going to clean up this effort, but at the end of the day, what's going to drive the overall success of the Duwamish is not our cleanup effort so much, but what's coming in from the broader system. And so I think from that, I want to challenge you all, and I appreciate that you're here, to think about what is it that we do on an everyday basis that results and is contributing to this, and what can we do to change that behavior? Because it's things like washing our cars in our driveways or putting pesticides on our lawns, all of this stuff gets back into our environment and gets back into our waterways. And if we want to clean up places like the Duwamish or Puget Sound, we have to think about the best ways to do that, not just from the historic legacy pollution, but also from the ongoing way that we just live in our industrialized world.